I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on managing remote and virtual teams. It is my pleasure to introduce our featured presenter today. She is executive leadership coach and professional development consultant, Ms. Erin Cambier. Erin, you now have the floor. Thanks, Kelly. I am really excited to be here with you guys today talking about managing remote and virtual teams. Uh, leadership is something I'm extremely passionate about. And as you all likely know, um, with our global workforce, we're moving more and more towards virtual and remote teams. So it's understanding how can we lead, grow, and develop high-performing teams uh, on a remote and virtual level really can empower your organization and you as a leader to continue to take your team um, and your organization to the next level. Level. We're going to spend um, the first half talking about, um, well, more than the first half of our, our webinar today, talking about this topic, and we definitely will have time for questions at the end. So I encourage you to jot down your questions or throw them in the chat box, and Kelly will um, share them with us. So if you have any questions along the way, um, don't hesitate to ask. So our topic today, by the end of this webinar, you'll be able to identify some of the areas that are critical to successfully managing your remote and virtual team, as well as start to build a roadmap to address some of those key areas of concern um, that are really holding you back from extreme success as a remote and virtual team manager. So let's first talk about what we are defining as a remote and virtual team. And before we do that, I would love to get a brief idea of who we have participating today. So um, Kelly has a poll put together. If you can weigh in and let us know if you currently work on a virtual or remote team, um, maybe you have worked on a virtual team in the past, um, or if you're just new to this and ready to learn um, and have never been a part of a virtual poll, then weigh in on that last one. So Kelly, open the poll. So go ahead and weigh in and then we will share our results. All right, Erin. So it looks like we're seeing a, about a half of, every, of the attendees on the call are uh, currently working on a virtual team. Then we've got a small percentage of about 10% that have worked on a virtual team in the past. Um, same percentage, about 10% that have never worked on a virtual or remote team. Um, about 4% uh, will be working on a remote team and about 35% uh, will be managing a remote team. Okay, perfect. Good, good. Uh, a good uh, di diversity in terms of backgrounds on our webinar today, and I'm very confident this content will help you whether you are currently on a team or you're just new to that um, circumstance or, you know, working uh, virtually or remotely. So let's talk about what our definition of a virtual or remote team is. So as you likely know, a team is a group of people with a high degree of interdependence working together. So a virtual remote team is a team whose members are separated geographically. So as you may know, this could include people who work from home, and it also includes people that work maybe in a satellite office working with others remotely. So remote doesn't necessarily just have to be you're the only one separated. Uh, it could be uh, I worked remotely for a while. I worked in an office, but the rest of my team was actually located in the corporate office. Um, so I was reporting to someone there and my entire team was there. I was working um, away from them. So that would be a remote working situation. Um, so all of the topics today apply in all of those different types of situations. And then also recognizing that sometimes there are roles that might be partially uh, remote. So maybe you're with the group for part of the week and then you work from a different uh, place the remaining part of the week. All of the topics um, will apply to all of those audiences. Whoops, let me go back here. All right, I love this visual. Um, it's a model of remote and virtual teams. And I want you to think about how, as we go through the topic today, how this compares to our in-person teams. And a lot of the leadership areas that we focus on in terms of how to lead a successful team remotely are also very relevant in our in-person teams. There's just sometimes more challenges and more dynamics at play when we are um, working and leading remotely or virtually. So this is a good visual that applies to both remote as well as in-person teams. And it's broken down into the functions of what we do are our tasks. The way that we support our team members uh, through our communication is listed there. 
Uh, that might be email, phone, instant message um, meetings, the ways that we communicate. And then the foundation is our relationship management. So if you're a leader, if you're a manager, I want you to think about where we typically spend a majority of, of our time right now. So as a, as a leader and you go throughout your week, it's so easy to get caught up in the tasks, right? That immediate, that help me resolve this problem or the fire that's going and we're working on putting that out. And we can very easily get sucked into that task management, which means all the other areas can sometimes go by the wayside. But support or communication is just as critical as well as the foundation it says in there is that relationship management. It's important to get an understanding that having that foundation of relationship management is going to allow you to better communicate with your teams and ultimately to better execute on those tasks. Let's talk about the qualities of remote and virtual team managers that um, make you successful. So again, as we're looking through this list, these are very similar to what a manager, what makes a manager successful when you are in the office working with someone every day. So managers ensuring that responsibilities are clear. In terms of that, what that means is just clarity about who's expected to do what, what I'm responsible for and what you're responsible for. Successful managers have authorities that are well-defined and they have clear criteria to determine if team members are doing a good job. In other words, how do I know when I'm successful? And how is that measured? Uh, how does my manager know that? And how do I as a team member know that? So that is uh, what makes a manager successful. Now throw in the challenge of working remotely. So uh, we all know what happens when we assume, right? And when we handle situations and assumptions are made, it's not healthy for anyone. Um, however, when we're working remotely, sometimes those things are implied or assumed. So I emailed them the instruction manual for how to do this, and I'm going to assume, because I would be someone that would read that, that they read that. Um, so all of a sudden, maybe responsibilities are not clear, and there is no clarity around what people are responsible for, or who's doing what. And as a manager, you're frustrated because you think, why are they not doing what they're supposed to do? I communicated that with them. And obviously then the team member would also be potentially uh, frustrated in that situation too. So it's not that anyone's doing anything wrong. It's that as in that remote or virtual circumstance, we have to go to extra effort to make sure, have I clearly communicated responsibilities? Do people clearly know um, what they're responsible for, and if they're they're successful, if they're doing a good job. Another criteria is team members, is ensuring as a manager that team members' interests are being met. So their physical work environment, um, just overall health. As we know, a healthy team member, a healthy employee is not just exceptional at work, they're, they're balancing all of those things well. And the last thing is great managers build and maintain a sense of team identity. So they're creating a sense of belonging and shared identity. And this last one is probably the most challenging for remote and virtual teams. If you, for those of you who marks that you're, you have worked remotely or you are working remotely, I'm sure you've experienced this firsthand as a part of the team that you're on, that it's very easy to feel potentially alone in situations or, oh, I don't wanna bother anyone because it's more work uh, to pick up the phone and call someone than it would be maybe just to walk around the corner to their office and say, hey, do you have a minute? So we can tend to isolate ourselves as team members. So as a manager, it's really important to be aware of that and be creating that culture up front that you want people to reach out and creating that collaborative environment and really thinking about how can I help my team build and maintain a sense of team identity um, in a way that they're working from home, but still feel a part of our team's mission, vision, purpose, and that they understand their role and how it's contributing to the success of our team. This is another good slide about bringing together those three dynamics in, in successful team leadership. Um, and it says here, remote and virtual team management model is Relationship management is the foundation. And when we do that strongly, then we also manage the way that we communicate. And we're gonna talk about all three of these things in the next, in the remainder of our session today. Um, we're also managing effective communication. And when we do that, it's then going to allow us to be able to effectively manage tasks.
as a leader, I just want to reiterate, it's very common that we go right to task because that's a tangible thing. It's black and white, I can measure it. But when we only focus on task and not in the rest of the areas, um, typically we're going to get frustrated because it's very often that, um, that those tasks either are not being executed or not managed in a long-term vision um, because that relationship found it, foundation isn't, isn't there or because maybe that communication foundation isn't there. It's not that people don't want to do their tasks or that they don't want to execute on those. It's that we have to be able to bring all three of those areas together um, for leadership success. So think about how that applies to your team today and think about how you're spending your week. Are you spending a majority of your time managing tasks? Are you balancing how to set up effective communication with your teams? And are you balancing also how you're managing those relationships and creating a positive working relationship, that sense of team identity with your group? I'm gonna go back a slide. I just wanted to mention tying into that relationship management, that bullet that, that says team members' interests are being met, physical, financial, psychological, et cetera, that I think, I think we're okay for now, Tanisha, thanks. That, um, that is so important because when you're work, working remotely, we just don't know what other people have on their plate, even in physical working conditions. We don't know what their home office is like. We've maybe never been there. So asking questions, um, giving them tools and resources to be able to set up, to know how do I even set up an effective home office? How do I set myself up for success to make sure that you know long-term that your team member overall, their interests are being met is really critical in that virtual team and not making assumptions. Maybe you know how to set up a virtual office, but don't assume that everyone does. Um, so just really bringing those things into light and, and talking about those things can be a huge thing that can tie directly into communication, of course, as well as managing relationships. That team member then will build trust with you. They will know my manager cares about my success as a person and not just managing my tasks, but really looking at that overall, um, who they are as a person is going to contribute to the success of that team. Okay, so take a minute and I want you to think about how much time do you spend every day reacting to those fires that I mentioned earlier? So the unplanned events, is that less than an hour? Is that maybe a couple hours? Or is that a majority of your day? And you're not in trouble, no matter what your answer is here. So we didn't create a poll with this because this is really more about, I want you to self-reflect and really think about. Now, I know that may change from day to day based upon, uh, you know, we had a tornado in my city last week. Now, obviously, we spend a majority of the day reacting to unplanned, you know, unplanned events. But on an average week, <clears throat> on an average day, how much time are you spending on unplanned events? Because what happens, and I'm going back a slide again, um, when we spend time in too much time in those unplanned events, which area do you think we end up spending a majority of our time? It's the task management. So those unplanned events are going to suck us right into task management. And if we have too much of our day, every single day spent in only managing tasks, then just by nature, our communication and our relationships are going to suffer. So when you're working remotely, recognize it's really, it's much easier to get sucked into those unplanned events, into that task management. So how can I better bring some balance to that? Um, so if you're spending a majority of the day or even more than um, a couple hours a day, this is a good opportunity for you to potentially think about how can I make that shift with my team um, today, tomorrow, immediately, and move from reactive to proactive leadership. Just by nature, managing remote and virtual teams can really be highly reactive. Um, we're managing our cross time zones. There's challenges in terms of, you know, people need information by the close of their business day, and that may not be the close of your business day. You may have even more limited time uh, depending upon where you're living, or maybe you're having to, you know, adjust your hours based upon that. And problems from different locations need to be resolved, you know, on different timelines. So that can automatically shift us into that highly reactive nature. So it's important to recognize that effective management in a remote and virtual environment really requires us to shift to becoming more proactive. 
That doesn't mean that there won't be fires. That doesn't mean there won't be things that come up that still need to be closed by the end of the business day. But it does mean that a majority of our time, rather than a majority of that being reactive, we're shifting to that being proactive. This allows us um, to react to the ur urgent requirements, to react to those fires, but still be able to plan to act to those important issues. So those important issues would be our proactive things. So you may have heard of the 80-20 philosophy, um, the Pareto principle um, to get more things done in your day. Um, and if you haven't heard of this, what it is, is that 20% studies show, um, and this gentleman was an Italian philosopher, um, Mr. Pareto, um, he discovered that the 80-20 principle. And it shows that 20% of our actions actually lead to 80% or influence 80% of our results. And he discovered this in the 1800s after discovering that 20% of his plants in his garden actually produced 80% of his garden of that, that result. And then he started studying that in economics and in finances and in relationships and in our in team dynamics. And they found that really this affects everything in life in general is that 80-20 philosophy. So while the 80-20 is not necessarily set in stone, it's a good number to keep in mind in terms of that general concept of a majority of your outputs, in other words, your, your revenue or the, the things that you're going to accomplish for success every week are going to come from that 20% of that really important work that you're doing. So when you understand this, you can use those ideas to move those really important topics um, into those actions to really be more purposeful and not reactive, um, but really to utilize that 20% of your actions or activities to drive 80% of your results. So I recommend you spend some time determining what matters, what is most important in your week, what's most important in your team in terms of success. So that might be evaluating your current processes, uh, maybe your current products, maybe even your team or your customer base, your overall revenue. Remember, it's not, as a leader, it's not primarily about your personal productivity. It's about focusing the efforts of your team on that crucial 20% of action that drives the most important outcomes. So recognize that 20% that influence at 80% and identify that. And when you make that shift and empower your team to be able to focus those efforts in that way, it really can be life-changing for your team. So in order to do this remotely, there's some tools and resources we're gonna talk about uh, in the next few minutes in terms of communication and technology that can help with that. But if you don't have this at your foundation, if you don't have your foundation focused and I really wanna be a proactive leader, no matter what, if you're utilizing all the tools, you're utilizing all the right communication, but your goals are not clearly defined, you still won't be successful. So it's important to don't skip over this. Don't just shift to, well, and to manage remotely, I need to do these things to communicate, or I need to do these tasks, but it's really bringing all these things together, creating clearly defined goals, determining what matters so that you can really proactively move your team forward. Here's a management model for remote and virtual teams. We know that as leaders, we wear a lot of hats. Um, and our management models for traditional or what is known as co-located teams are typically pretty well understood. Um, as we look at that in terms of a remote and virtual dynamic, again, many of these things are the same. We just need to apply a little bit different mindset and shift that into that remote um, or virtual situation. So Henry Mitzberg is one of the world's premier management thinkers. Um, he wrote a book in the early 90s that is actually still very um, renowned today in terms of the foundation for leadership. And he defined three major groupings of roles um, in terms of those management work. So we have our interpersonal roles, our informational roles, and our decisional roles. These roles require developing peer relationships, maybe carrying out negotiations, motivating your team, resolving conflicts, establishing communication or information networks, um, making decisions with potentially little or very ambiguous information, um, and allocating your resources. 
So in this process at different times, you're really wearing different hats. You're wearing an interpersonal hat at the same time you're wearing an informational hat, at the same time you're, you're wearing a decisional hat, but you need to apply those different circumstances and be able to adapt that in that virtual role um, to really expand your focus and define what your team team success looks like and how you can set your team up for success in that. So think about as you go through your week, what am I doing that applies in those interpersonal relationships, informational and decisional? So in the course of that, uh, information management is critical. So in order for us to be able to equip our teams, we talked about tasks, um, communication, and building relationships. We're going to talk about some tools for doing that. There are many um, platforms available to enable collaboration and information sharing. You may have utilized some of those we have listed there, SharePoint, Dropbox, um, Google Docs, Google Drive. It's really important that as a manager, you are investing in your team and you're giving them the tools and resources they need to be able to share information. Um, remotely, it becomes even more of a challenge as we know, because we can't walk around the corner into that office um, to make sure that somebody got the email we sent or make sure that they got the information that was transferred. So it's really making sure that you are taking that to the next level. Maybe your company, we have included in there, whatever platform you choose, it should of course meet your organizational standards um, and requirements, but also be a manager who is leading in finding new technologies, finding ways that your team can better collaborate and better share information. Before I taught this, and this is, uh, as Kelly mentioned, a snippet from our uh, full day, well, two day course. Um, and before I taught the full course, I got every time I do that, I always solicit feedback from people who are currently working remotely. Um, I, I work remotely. I have worked remotely in the past. I've led remotely and I've been in those dynamics and coach people working remotely. But I think it's important to also get feedback from others in the course of that. And so one uh, person, one feedback that an employee emailed me that I think was really valuable, this employee said, investing in new ways to communicate and finding what works for my specific team is what I value most about my manager. Um, she said, one team I was on had people that were more comfortable on the phone, so we did a lot of calls. Another team, we did a lot of video chats using WebEx or Skype. Um, also using products like Slack or Microsoft Teams, if you haven't heard of those, those are products that allow team collaboration in real time. And they take those conversations out of email, uh, which is nice to potentially free up your email box so that you can use that for more official use. Um, those systems allow for more internal team collaboration or communication with client topics. Um, and this employee specifically said, it's really nice that my company invests in all these things and that my manager is always looking for new ways to raise the level that we communicate. And I thought this was great feedback because that's probably the thing I hear most often is employees really appreciate when managers are um, not resistant, even though you may not know that technology, even though you may have never used that technology, but that you're willing to embrace and learn is one of the most critical uh, roles as a manager. And there's a lot more different technology and tools. Those are some of the most common. Um, the ones that I've utilized and recommend are you know, listed on the screen as well as, like I mentioned, Slack or Microsoft Teams are tools that allow you to have some of that real-time collaboration uh, and have conversations outside of that email. So that leads right to the next topic, which is about innovation. Innovation or information management for remote teams and innovation in remote enables us to be innovative. Um, one of the advantages of working with teams in remote or virtual environments is that we get to bring in broader perspectives, right? We get to, to be able to tap knowledge and information from people literally all over the world. So this should be encouraged. Um, it helps us drive innovation and new ideas, and it's absolutely going to help our teams be more successful. Many times we can get stuck on that task, as I've mentioned, and we can just get focused in that day to day. And when that happens, sometimes we can get our blinders on, right? And with those blinders doesn't allow those new and innovative ideas to come in. So I want to encourage you that continue to think outside of that box, continue to leave those 
uh, hopefully the blinders nice and wide or remove them all together because it's going to allow you to ex achieve excellence as a leader. It's going to help you create innovative and self-driven teams. And I wanted to remind you that as a leader, it's up to you to create that culture of innovation. An innovative culture really raises the bar of performance. An innovative culture allows a team to be comfortable sharing their ideas and sharing new things and welcomes feedback and doesn't get stuck in the status quo. And when we're in remote teams, there is a dynamic that can happen that we can just easily get stuck in that status quo. So encourage people to step outside of their box. And maybe you think, I've, gosh, I've encouraged that for such a long time. I feel like I've, I've, you know, that's a dead horse. I've beaten that dead horse. Well, I'm here to say it's never too much. Um, it's never a situation that you should stop saying, um, you know, new ideas aren't welcome. And so thinking about whether that be, um, maybe there's flexibility you can bring in in terms of flexible work hours. Um, that can allow people to potentially work at times that they are most productive or most creative, rather than saying we work from eight to five um, Central Standard Time and everyone across all time zones needs to adapt to this. Um, that could potentially have people in Pacific time getting up and working early. Maybe that's their best time or maybe that's their worst time. If your company has the ability um, to, to, to let people potentially set their hours, it can allow, again, potential um, people really achieving excellence because they're able to work at the times that they are most successful and most productive. Um, now, your company may not allow that. You may, maybe they work in a customer service organization where they're answering phone calls during certain hours, and that just can't be changed. Um, so that's, that's totally okay, but think about how can I continue to be innovative as their leader to better communicate with them, better motivate them, better drive them, better help them feel included, or that sense of team identity. Um, how can I continue to raise the bar of excellence with that? Um, one thing I wanted to mention also with that is even just something as small as breaks. Um, in an office environment, you know, maybe it's an environment where we take an hour lunch and we take two 15 minute breaks during an eight hour shift typically. Well, in a remote environment, breaks might need to look a little bit different. Um, maybe they're taking more five minute breaks because if you weren't remotely, you know that sitting down all day um, or even for several hours straight can you know, not be healthy for us. So maybe that involves more breaks throughout the day or two shorter you know, lunch time periods. Talking with your teams about that and helping them think outside the box can really help set them up um, for success as well. And encourage those employees to do that. If they work from home, you know, encourage them to make sure that they are getting out of their home office once in a while because it's going to contribute to that healthy um, environment overall and that healthy mindset that will allow them to be most successful you know, when they do re-enter that home office. Something that's helpful in terms of looking at, okay, what do I need to do as a leader to set my team and myself up for success is, so you've taken a step back and you've created clarity in, in roles and in relationships and really in, you know, where is my team going? What's, what's most important? Sorry, Kelly, is the webcam still good? I see it j jumping around a little bit there. Yes, it looks good. Okay, thanks. Um, technology at its finest, right guys? Um, so, um, in the course of as we're creating clarity, uh, we really want to define who are our stakeholders in our remote and virtual team. And this is typically something that comes easier in a in-person work environment. So taking some time to do this remote and virtually is really critical. So start by listing all the areas uh, where your team works. So this might be different countries or states, um, different divisions or departments. Um, just thinking about where is my team at? Um, and who is involved in that, those relationships. People who are involved in your work or who stand to gain or lose as a result of your work are considered a stakeholder. Um, and then include, as you're making your list of stakeholders, um, those teams who may have a shared interest in what your team is doing. So um, as it said there, people who stand to gain or lose as a result of your work, um, they are still potentially gain or losing. They may not be necessarily a part of your team, but that's that shared interest in those results also. Those are our stakeholders. 
oftentimes one of the challenges in terms of stakeholders is, especially if you work in a situation where part of your team is in one office and, and one is in another office, um, I'll give the example of when I worked remotely for a while and my entire team um, was four hours away, I could have people coming into my office um, who had a shared interest in what I was doing, um, but ultimately I was not responsible for their results. What I was responsible for was the team that was in that office four hours away. But my manager needed to recognize that Erin um, is working remotely and she has a shared interest and some of the things that she's doing may impact that group locally. So she had to create as a part of the stakeholders, it wasn't just my team in terms of the team that was four hours away, but some of those stakeholders that were impacted by my work were also those local groups. So making sure that you're really thinking about that entire scope of stakeholders is important. There may be some direct stakeholders and then some indirect. And then what you're going to do with that list, once you have made that list, is really think about how can I build relationships to set my team member and these stakeholders up for success. So as we have in the slide here, um, build relationships with people who are influential in the organization that you'll be involved with, such as decision makers and the direct managers and supervisors or the remote staff. You want to provide those stakeholders with information about what you have going on and the projects that you are going on. And this is where that communication, so we're talking about building relationships as a foundation, communicating, so that's providing information, and then it allows us the ability to execute on those tasks. So you want to keep everyone in the loop in terms of you know, what's most important to you and your staff, what you're working on, what projects are going on, and then how your responsibility will impact them. So for example, uh, I was working on a project, um, when I was working remotely, I was working on a project to build a new uh, corporate training department. Um, or overall, you know, leadership development program for the company. I, again, I was reporting to a team that was four hours away, a human resources and executive division, but I was working locally um, with a customer service um, division and there were some sales teams there. So it was important that relationships were built with those key stakeholders who were ultimately going to be going through that um, uh, corporate learning environment situation. And so not only did I need to build those relationships, but my manager did too. So that those customer service managers, those sales managers understood what we were working on, what was important and how my impact, what my responsibility would and how that would impact them. And then once that's, that project was launched, we could all come together on that rather than, than it feeling like a surprise or rather than me being taken away by an immediate thing that's going on locally where they may have needed, maybe they had an immediate training need or they had a someone that needed to be hired or something that happened immediately, um, which again, sometimes we have to deal with those urgent issues, but we can still remain picture, you know, focus on that big picture goal. Just wanna reiterate those strong relationships absolutely pay dividends when issues arise. So let's say I'm working on building that corporate university and um, the sales manager comes in and says, oh my gosh, all my sales team, they're really struggling. Can you come in and build a training because we really need to make revenue this month and I need you to help us get there. So having solid relationships with my boss and with those areas allowed us to be able to address the immediate and urge it urgent, excuse me, while still remaining on that big picture goal and continuing to move forward in that building that that learning and corporate university, which ultimately is going to allow those sales teams truly to be able to get those short term and long term goals. Okay, let's talk about success criteria for your remote and virtual team. And this was mentioned earlier in one of those slides, just a little snippet, so we wanted to expand on this further, that it's important to define what makes someone successful. Um, you don't want to send them out with just a bunch of tasks and, and expect them to be micromanaged or even to want to be micromanaged. Um, and it's important that they can self-regulate and know when they have achieved success as well. So an effective way to define success criteria is to, to take a step back and determine what is the ideal future and what's that gonna look like? So in other words, begin with the end in mind. Um, just like with anything else, if you don't have a goal, you'll achieve it every time. 
In other words, if we're all just kind of floundering around, um, we're not going to, to get where we want to get. So don't get caught up in tasks. What is that ideal future? Create that, define that, and then work backwards. And when you do that, you'll then be able to identify areas where there's room for improvement. Um, you'll be able to determine appropriate measures to get to those areas of improvement. And then remembering to include, because you've defined who your key stakeholders are, um, include those interests of those key stakeholders when developing those success criteria. So for example, I'm, I'm using my situation, for example, from earlier that my um, executive who was four hours away had to keep in mind the interests of those key stakeholders when de determining what was important for our division and our team. Because if we, if we operate with blinders, we might be successful short term, but we won't be successful long term. So knowing who are those key stakeholders, defining that um, is really critical to then be able to identify their interests and, and, and build that together when you're determining how is my team and when is my team successful. So let's talk about the impact of separation. If you've worked remotely, you probably have experienced this already, but when people work co-located or in the same office, relationships are just naturally built quickly. Um, and they're based on that common context in the workplace. This is that, that water cooler um, conversation type of thing where you know, you're gonna run into somebody in the break room or even in the hallway. Maybe you've never spoken to a person before, but every time you see them in the hallway, they smile at you, you have a positive impact, a positive impression of them already. When we're working remotely, we may not interact. And if we only interact in phone calls, we don't know if someone is smiling at us when they talk to us or not. And so it's recognizing that there are um, sometimes assumptions made. If I don't hear from someone, there are people that may assume if I don't hear from that, them, they must not like me. And there are other people who assume if I don't hear from them, no big deal, they must like me. So I want you to think about, first of all, where you are in that spectrum. And I want to encourage you to always assume that positive intent on behalf of your team or the people that you interact with. Um, and then I want to encourage you also to be extremely deliberate in staying connected with your team. And knowing that some people are just wired to automatically assume positive or assume negative. So we have to go above and beyond to make sure that team members know that they are to feel connected um, and that they are a part of a bigger picture and a part of that team. So with remote, as we, we have in the slide with remote and virtual teams, the context breaks down because if they have not worked together before, um, they likely have never met face to face. Um, it may include some new team members or some people that, um, you know, they're not familiar with. And in every situation, in every dynamic, including working remotely, guys, both logic and feelings are involved. Our emotions drive our decisions throughout our day. Um, and many of things, these things are subconscious. And we have a great training about that. Emotional intelligence is an exceptional class for understanding that, how to utilize your feelings to drive positive behavior. Um, but as a remote manager, it's important to recognize that your employees are always making an, an impression. There is no such thing as neutral, really, in leadership. You have to be actively engaged in moving forward in positive relationships, or many times you're actually moving back and you don't know it. So feelings and opinions, as you likely know, can cause relationship problems. Um, remote teams only get to communicate virtually. So we have to keep in touch. We have to utilize our communication to really, to its fullest extent, um, so that our teams have unlimited freedom to build those relationships uh, and hopefully avoid those relationship problems. It's important that they're allowed to talk, to chat, to collaborate throughout the day on their own circumstances. Um, it's going to make your job easier as a boss. You don't want them to come to you for everything and it's going to make their job easier because what employee wants to have to go to their boss about everything. So giving them tools and resources and ways to interact and chat throughout the day isn't going to just allow them to get their tasks done, but it's going to allow them to actually be better connected, to feel more synergy um, and to be able to build more positive relationships. So let's talk about remote and virtual team perceptions. When working remotely with people we've never met other than virtually, it's really easy to define our perception of the person based upon stereotypes or opinions or even interpretations of what they're communicating. And I'm sure you're thinking, 
oh, yep, everybody does that except me, <laughs> right? Because it's so easy to see when other people do it. But I want to encourage you that, um, honestly, we all do it. Again, whether we consciously or subconsciously have that, we have to recognize this happens. And we have to then consciously work to override that. We have to be aware of these biases and make every effort to get to know people um, that we're working with or customers or those, those different dynamics. We have to make efforts to build relationships. Um, studies show that we just naturally congregate to people that are like us. Uh, in hiring, studies show that as managers, we tend to hire mini-me's. Um, and it, in many, much of this is driven subconsciously, but we tend to hire people that are like us, that have similar um, interests, similar opinions, maybe even similar communication styles. We naturally have that gut instinct of, oh, I really like them, I need to hire them. And so we have to work against that gut instinct a little bit when it comes to hiring number one, because diversity and having someone who is different than us is so valuable to the team. Um, but, a, but what that can bring in, that diversity can also bring in potential um, disconnect because when people are different than us, it's easier for us to feel disconnected. It's easier for us to interpret that difference as wrong um, versus just being different. So I want to encourage you next time you think that person doesn't like me or I don't like that person to use that as an indication of I need to get to know that person better. Um, there's a quote from Abraham Lincoln that I love to share, and it's, I don't like that person, I must get to know him better. And I often think of that when I have that gut instinct of, mm, I, you know, I'm not sure uh, if that person likes me. It just means lean into that professionally and make sure that you're over communicating with them. Make sure that you're really working purposely to build a relationship. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have healthy boundaries. That's a whole separate topic. But it does mean that remotely and virtually just recognizing that some of those stereotypes and those perceptions um, our gut instinct cannot sometimes lead us in a different direction just because of our previous opinions or previous just differences. Differences are not always um, a bad thing. Differences can actually make us. Hi, Erin. I think you uh, auto accidentally muted yourself, so we can't hear your audio. Erin, can you hear us? I'm sorry, everyone. We're going to try and work with Aaron here. Aaron, I, if you could hear us, you muted yourself, so we can't hear you. There you go. Oh, hey. Luckily, <laughs> somebody who's on the webinar came in the office. Thankfully, I'm uh, remote, but not remote. So when did I lose you? I know you've been seeing my, um, my head pop around right a little when, bit. Right when you started talking about creating the remote and virtual team ground rules. Okay, perfect. Just the slide. I was thinking, oh, did I lose you five slides ago? That's not very effective. Okay, so creating remote and virtual ground rules. Um, some areas to consider for that um, are, how are you going to communicate with your team? Um, what are the preferred methods? Some companies prefer email, some prefer instant message, some prefer video, and I'm going to talk about the different technology and um, our suggestions in that for best um, effectiveness in just a moment. But thinking about that and communicating that with your team up front is really um, a powerful way to go about that. And how are you going to manage your meetings? Sometimes we just manage our meetings by I'll show up and I'll lead everything and we'll go. But really being purposeful in how am I going to manage those meetings, create collaboration, build relationships is really important. And then what kind of behavior are you going to expect within your teams? Um, we'll discuss this more uh, in the next couple slides about culture and 
those dynamics, but really being purposeful if you haven't already to the idea of what kind of expectations do I have around how we communicate, how our meetings are ran, and what kind of behavior we expect uh, is really important in a remote environment. And, and as we have on the slide there, test those rules um, by asking yourself, um, what would the impact be if that ground rule is not followed? So this doesn't mean you have to rule with a, a heavy fist, but it means setting clear expectations, communicating those expectations, and holding the team accountable to them will truly set you up for success in all leadership roles, but especially critical in that remote and virtual um, environment. Okay, I didn't lose you on audio, did I, Kelly? We're all good. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So how to strengthen your remote and virtual team? Um, feedback is so critical in all roles, but especially remote or virtual teams. Um, having a team member who knows how they're performing, um, if they're being successful, uh, is just so critical. And so how are you going to share that feedback with someone remotely? Maybe a little bit different. Because again, maybe you can pop into their office when you're in an in-person working environment. But in a remote environment, you need to be more purposeful of that. I love the idea of having scheduled one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with your staff. I cannot encourage it enough. Um, for all leaders, weekly is a great just general guideline. Do you have a one-on-one -on -one schedule with your team? But virtually and remotely, it's, it's really critical. Um, it's going to be that time where your team is going to know that they can connect with you. It's that time they know it's going to allow you to build relationships and it opens that door of feedback. Um, and we have on the slide here, encourage peer reviews of work on a regular basis. And some companies have a formal peer review process, which is great, but I want to encourage you, even if your company doesn't, what that means is just creating that situation where we have a team that is comfortable to give each other feedback and receive feedback uh, will really help your success as a manager, and especially remotely. Um, feedback is important when building a team because it allows team members to know what they're doing right um, and areas that they need to work on. So it lets us troubleshoot in the moment. And if team members are allowed to give feedback to each other, it's going to create a, a collaborative environment that's going to set that team up for success. So this can come from you as a manager where you are driving that. Um, it provides more interaction um, where you're maybe in a team meeting, you're able to create a situation where we're giving and receiving feedback. Or when a team member comes to you and says, so-and-so is always doing this, Maybe you encourage them and say, have you talked to them about it? Rather than saying, I'll take care of it, um, you're empowering that team member um, and you maybe you're coaching them through ways that they can effectively, not in an attacking way, um, give that feedback, which is going to strengthen their relationship and it's going to strengthen your relationship uh, as, a, as a supervisor with them. So setting expectations. Uh, as we've talked about, it's really critical in those remote um, and virtual teams to set expectations. But it's also important to recognize as a leader that people who work remote or virtually typically come in with a higher than normal skill level. They're people who don't need to be micromanaged, um, nor do they want to be micromanaged. And so something I often see in remote environments is we hire someone because we are very confident, oh, they're going to be able to you know, take the ball and run and work independently and do an excellent job. But then all of a sudden, I feel like as a manager, I'm working remotely that, oh my gosh, I don't know if they're doing what they need to do. So I need to keep my thumb on them and know exactly that they're doing everything that they need to do because I feel like that's my job as a manager. I'm here to tell you, it's not your job as a manager to micromanage or to have to have your thumb on them every minute of the day. That in remembering, I hired somebody that has a high level of expertise or a higher than normal level of skills, I need to also empower them. I need to, yes, in the beginning, train them, equip them, maybe work closer with them, but know that um, you're going to let go and let them run with that. Um, so individual performance plans need to reflect higher expectations for their roles on the team. Um, empowering your team in all roles is going to continue to up-level your team's performance and the individual performance, but especially remotely. Um, involve them, set the goals, involve them in those decisions, and let them take the ball and run. 
that's where having a comfort level of that team knowing what are our expectations, how do I determine success, how is my manager going to communicate with me, allows me as a remote team member to really achieve excellence in that relationship. And then once we achieve excellence, let's recognize it, right? We all appreciate recognition. No employee is above it. Um, but sometimes this is also something that can fall by the wayside in remote or virtual team environments. It's that, you know, running into somebody in the break room and saying, hey, Sam, great job. I saw that customer you landed. Awesome. Um, those things just don't happen naturally. We have to be more purposeful in recognition also. Um, recognition is a key component of any team, but especially remotely in order for our team to build and maintain that cohesiveness and team identity, we have to have a strong um, recognition uh, or, you know, a team identity and feeling that they're a part of that and that they're feeling valued and engaged. So take a moment and tell your team, tell them how they're doing. This is why I love scheduled one-on-ones because what a better opportunity than that to share recognition, to give some kudos, um, to even give feedback where you're creating that collaborative environment for team members. They're also going to be to feel empowered to recognize each other. Some companies have a formal recognition program. If your company does, great. Utilize it. Utilize it to the nth degree. Be the leader who takes full advantage of that. Um, but whether or not they have a formal recognition program, honestly, it doesn't matter. It's up to you as a manager to create that culture where we are recognizing each other's achievements. Some easy things such as starting off a meeting rather than jumping right into um, goals and what's going on in terms of tasks, start every meeting with three minutes of recognition. Hey, I want to kick it off. Let's start with some open recognition. And you turn it over to the team. And that's their time to recognize each other. That's a great way to build a culture of recognition and empower them to recognize each other, as well as then you creating that culture um, of recognition by jumping on board with that as well. So let's talk about communication and coordination in remote teams. Uh, again, regardless of whether you are co-located, in other words, in the same office or working remotely, communication and coordination is essential. Um, you're need, it's needed to plan the work, assign responsibilities, ultimately to get the job done. And as we know, when we're working with remote teams, um, it, there is a much higher level of importance um, and purposefulness needed in that. If you're not connecting consistently as a remote team, your days will quickly turn into weeks, which will quickly turn into months. And the next thing you know, you'll have a team who is feeling isolated or disconnected from the organization's goals and mission or from each other as a team. So in absence of communication, research shows that um, groups will tend to react more negatively, and especially, and overall in general, millennials will react more negatively than previous generations. And millennials are more so wanting to work remotely. So it's really important that we are focusing on how can I communicate with this team? Um, scheduling predictable, reoccurring, and agreed upon meetings um, is critical, and that's really gonna allow all of these things to come together. As a remote manager, communication will be the majority, will be the major focus of your work. Do not get caught up in the task of communication management, though. Make sure that you're being purposeful um, in building the relationships and recognizing that is a part of communication. So technology is what allows us to work remotely, right? It is the best gift that it has allowed our organizations to go to the next level in terms of being able to hire people all over the world. But as we know, it also is a potential trap for us in terms of holding us back from building high-performing teams. It's important to remember, technology is at best an enabler of communication. We have listed there different types of communication that can happen. Um, but it is not a substitute for communication. It's so easy to get caught up in this, but recognize that even the best technology results on some filtering of communication. You can see me on video and you can hear my voice, but it is a little bit different than being in the same room. It is not fully there. It's probably as close as you can get, um, but it is two-dimensional and not three-dimensional. 
So it's important to think about how am I utilizing technology to set me up for success and not necessarily um, to, to hinder our relationships. Okay, so our next slide has um, effectiveness of communication channels. And I love this visual because it shows us exactly um, that pyramid. Um, and on the left-hand side, you'll see effectiveness of communication, the type of effectiveness of it, and then that bandwidth of whether it's narrow to broad. So face-to-face -face is the most effective form of communication. Um, so having a meeting with someone face-to-face -face is most effective. And then when working remotely, we know that's not an option. So the highest, most effective form of communication that we can have remotely is video conference. The second most effective is phone followed by email, and we don't even have it on here, instant messages below that. Now, I'm not saying there's not a purpose of instant message, but I am saying think about the purpose, what kind of effectiveness do I need in this communication and utilize the right communication tool when you're going about things is so critical. Most of us do not love video. Um, I, I, I could say it's probably safe to say 99% of people are going to say, you know, I don't love seeing myself on video and I will join that. I don't love being on video, but I recognize that it's a really effective form of communication. And if you just listen to a voice on this video, on this video today, it would be less effective because you wouldn't see the expression going in to our communication. You wouldn't see my facial expressions. Um, so I want to encourage you and when you're working remotely, video conferencing with your staff is so, so critical. Um, creating a culture of that. Are your meetings held via video? Maybe you're one-on-ones weekly, um, but you're able to build better relationships when you start that off with that video um, conference. And then maybe that's um, fostered by phone and email in that communication. So here's a good guide for choosing the right technology. No one technology platform is right for all, um, but this is a good guide. Um, our video technology is really important for those team meetings or especially when you're building relationships with someone. Um, audio conferencing for meetings, which would mean we're just calling in, in other words, um, and a phone call for short conversations. And I also included in here or emotional conversations. Reserve email and instant message for information sharing. Anytime there becomes a situation where there's a miscommunication or where you sense that emotions are, are elevating to a, a higher level, always, always pick up the phone. I know you're busy and it might take more time, but in the long run, I promise it's actually going to take less time to resolve that with a conversation or with a video call than it would to try to explain your, your situation or circumstance via email. So there are costs of communication. In other words, what is the information cost? But recognize that your time going into that, um, video calls are always going to be the most effective. And reserve instant message for just those side conversations or again, information quick exchange rather than obviously if anything becomes emotional also, do not use that in instant message. Pick up the phone and make that call. So the last topic is recognizing that when we're leading remotely, we have to look at there are culture, cultural differences that are going to impact our teams and our leadership. Um, these are going to affect the way that we communicate, even the work habits that we're bringing in, um, as well as our management style um, or their management style if you're leading other leaders. So managing in this environment means being aware of the cultural elements that each person in your team is bringing in and experiencing, and then educating your team on those cultural issues so that they can all embrace that uh, before they cause a problem. Again, assumptions are the worst thing and they will hurt you significantly as a leader in all areas, but also in the area of um, cultural differences. We tend to make broad generalizations about different nationalities. Um, this is, again, human nature. So we have to be purposeful in working against that. Um, we need to avoid stereotyping people according to their nationality and recognizing that that actually brings diversity and that sometimes um, language can be a barrier also, that maybe English is not someone's first language, it's their second language. So if you have someone on your team that has that, um, maybe a video call will be more effective because you'll be able to tell. They'll also be able to tell if you're not understanding. And there is nothing wrong with saying, 
could you repeat that again? Or could you slow down a bit? I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding that or even repeating back to them what they have said. That's going to break down those barriers of communication so that we can get um, past any of those cultural stereotypes in that process. Remember that diversity exists within every culture and it's a part of what makes us stronger and more valuable. And as a leader, our mindset that we approach in that um, is critical. So that's just an overview of our full training on this topic. Um, in the full training, we go way more in depth and we brainstorm and we actually put together a specific plan to help you work through some of those barriers. But this was the key points that hopefully you got some really good takeaways to be able to apply um, immediately on the topic of leading successful remote teams. Kelly, are there any questions that you wanna share? Thank you so much, Erin. Um, I don't see any questions right now, so I want to encourage you all, if you guys have any questions, uh, we will stay on the line for the next few minutes to get those answered. Um, also want to encourage you all to reach out to your local New Horizons um, for further information on this full-length course or any of our other uh, leadership and development offerings that we have. If you are not familiar with your local New Horizons, you can log on to newhorizons.com and do a zip code search to find the center nearest you. Um, on New Horizons com you will also find a full uh, schedule of upcoming classes and um, uh, detail more detailed information on the various classes that we offer and this specific one being under our Center for Leadership and Development. Um, also not sure if anyone had any questions on this but you will receive today's recorded presentation. Uh, you will receive it tomorrow morning. Um, so you can follow up with uh, anyone who may have missed the session or you can uh, review it at any time that you would like. And it looks like we don't have any questions, Erin. So I think we can go ahead and wrap up today's session. Thank you okay. so much for joining us. We always love when you come present for on behalf of New Horizons. Thanks, Kelly. It's my pleasure. All right. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us today. We hope you'll join us for future webinars. Have a great day.